I want to welcome you again to Connect Church if you're new here. Today's uh, series of messages that we've been in and we're going to continue next week, I hope is going to really bring a lot of healing, uh, perhaps to some hurt, maybe some confusion be eliminated, maybe some things that were misunderstood become understood. And I just want you to know as the, the pastor and under shepherd here, uh, I just want to build a healthy church. I don't care how big it is. I just want to build a healthy church. Can I have an amen? amen. And, uh, you know, we, we've said for years, and, and I wasn't always this way, but I don't care about a crowd. I want a healthy church. And I just want to, I want to help you guys grow. I am not here for popularity. I'm not here because I think I'm better than you. I, I'm just here because God's got an assignment uh, for me, and it's to help you. Amen. amen. So here's what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to give you in just a few minutes what I think is the number one reason people have a problem with church. So that's really what we're going to talk about. But I'm, I'm first, I'm going to go back to go forward because uh, I talked to Dev about this. and you know, he, Didn't he do a great job opening the series last week? Come on, somebody. Give it up for Pastor Devin. So proud of my son. Um, everything he learned, he learned from me. Uh, but uh, the premise of this, of this series uh, really is to just kind of unravel the knots and unpack the, 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 the complication of church and really in particular deal with some of the toxicity that we see in church today and, and really begin to move forward. And, and one of the reasons this happens, um, and, and Devin gave a definition, but I'll, I'll set it up by just saying there are a lot of abuses that we are familiar with and even talk about and even address. We address emotional abuse. We address physical abuse. We address spiritual abuse. But we never really seem to address what is probably just as damaging in some instances, and I've had, you know, front row seats with this, but that is spiritual abuse. So let's, let's just do this. Let's bring that definition back. Spiritual abuse is basically when there is a spiritual leader, a spiritual authority, who uses their power, their position, their personality, and manipulates or influences people to their preferences, not God's purposes. And, and this is a problem, and, and when people uh, leverage their leadership for themselves, and this can become very detrimental and, and, and very toxic. And the truth is sometimes the people that are supposed to be closest to God and representing the church are causing indirectly or directly a lot of people who are far from God who come to church to then walk away from the church. And, and this, is a, this is a modern issue today, and so you'll see... Uh, instances where there's there's a false, or you could say fake, fake family, fake believers, and there is fake teachings that are there. The Bible talks about this a lot, just so you know. All through the New Testament, uh, different authors inspired by the Holy Spirit talked about some of these problems that were in the church then, the early church then. In fact, in Galatians, it talks about false brethren, Galatians 2, 4, fake people. In, in Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 29, it talks about pretenders, uh, shepherds that were like savage wolves. And, and you see this in church today where the first thing, the priority of a service in many churches around the world and in America is make sure we take an offering. In fact, behind the scenes you hear people say, you know, like they, they feel like they were raking the coals. They were trying to just get as much out of their pockets as possible. The whole service is about the offering. That is a tragic toxicity in the church of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the reasons I didn't plan to say this. This is just coming to me right now. It's one of the reasons we actually intentionally do not pass a plate in this church. Because I don't want you to guilt give. I don't want you to tip. Come on, somebody. I don't want you to tip God. I want you to give out of your heart as a cheerful giver in response to your affection and love for him. And because you believe in the soil that you are sowing in. Are you with me, everybody? It's very intentional. I had a, there was a program here many, uh, many, many years ago, our Christmas program, and there was a person in the church, and he was a pastor in the community, and, and we, had, we had a fundraiser. We were raising funds for the kids. How many know I have no apologies for raising money for kids? Uh, but at that night, it was to enjoy the night. It was a production. And you know, this pastor came up to me and said, with all these people in here, you ought to take an offering. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to punch him in the face. Get out of my church. I don't want that, that stuff in my church. But that's the stuff that you've been exposed to, many of you, and much worse than that. And I just think it's, it's, it's immature people, the Bible says, devilish spies and savage shepherds that get there. But here's the reality. The reality is God is perfect, but the church is not. 
God is perfect, but the church is not. The church has some flaws and foibles and, and failures in it. And, and Scripture talks about it all day long. If you read your Bibles, everybody say, I'm going to read my Bible. More and more and more, in Jesus' name. But the, the Bible talks about, in James, it has, uh, James is addressing the church and saying, you got to stop all this classifications of people. And it talks about another place, Galatians. You got to get rid of the legalism. You got to get, you got to get rid of the gossip in the church. And and Paul talks to the Corinthians and says, well, you know, you guys got some lifestyle issues. You're worshiping God in church, but but there's there's sexual inappropriate behavior, and and you got to stop suing Christians. Christians don't sue Christians, and you got to take the Lord's Supper with reverence, and and you got to you got to make sure that you're 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 not overly familiar and desensitized, and you got a clear conscience when you do that. And Jesus, even in Revelation, he was so frustrated with the church, the Bible says he wanted to vomit. You, you, know, you know the church is not doing a good job when Jesus wants to throw up, okay? And, and so I just want you to know this problem that we have today, it's not new. It's been around a long, long time. It's just unfortunate we're not talking about it the way we should and the way we need to. But often the, these problems are pretty, are pretty serious. And, and I heard one person say that, that there are three different types of people. They're wise, they're foolish, and there are evil people. And one of the things, and this happens, and this can come into the church. And, and I just talked to a girl after the last service. Uh, by the way, I'm not highly caffeinated. I'm just really happy. But uh, <laughs> I was talking to this girl after church, and she, she had been in two types of churches, which I'll describe in just a minute. But, but both of them created a lot of damage and trauma uh, 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 for her. And I was just thinking, like, you know, people need to know how to discern you know, between those three types of people, wise, foolish, and evil. Let me just say something. Evil is you can't change evil. Evil is you got to run from evil. you got to get away from it. And, and I, sometimes I, I'm overwhelmed. I, I've been around the church and, and, and near some pretty egregious things in my ministerial experience, and, and I still kind of short-circuit that there can be, like, evil. Evil is just a hard thing to comprehend. You can't believe sometimes the capacity that people have to do harm to other people in different ways. It's, it's, and sometimes it's, it's hard for the brain to process. Foolish is different. Foolish is where people just make mistakes. Judas and Peter are an example of evil and foolish. Judas, uh, didn't ha Judas had a bad heart. Peter had a bad day. Jesus didn't rebuke Judas. Jesus didn't spend any time with that evil. He got away from it. Jesus did rebuke Peter, okay, because there, there's, there's, an, there's still potential. There's, there's a benefit. The, the person can be disciplined and discipled when they just do something wrong. They have a bad day. But when there's a bad heart, you need to stay away from that. So Jesus released Judas, but he restored Peter. And these two personalities represent the kind of a discernment process that you need. Some of you have been in church, and some of you are checking out a church like this. Some of you have to work some things out in your heart because of church, and you need to figure out, is, that, is, that, is there a Judas or is there a Peter in this situation? Because if it's a Peter in this situation, sometimes the problems that you have, there was a misunderstanding in the church. So therefore, understanding will fix it. But sometimes there's abuse in the church, and I'm just telling you, staying in that will not fix it. Is it a Judas or is it a Peter? Are you with me, everybody? Turn to your neighbor and say, this is good preaching so far. In either instance, in either instance, I want to tell you something. Satan is on assignment to use these foolish mistakes that people make and these evil people that try to hurt you, not just to separate you from people here, but ultimately, this is Satan's diabolical plan, is to separate you from God. And so people aren't just leaving the church, they're leaving the faith. Because of what happened in the church. Are you with me, everybody? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, it's Paul speaking to his spiritual son. And he basically says, uh, Timothy, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. The devil wants to hit you so hard that he knocks you right off your boat. He wants to shipwreck your faith. 
And I just want to speak over you. You are not here by accident. You are here on purpose. God has a word that's going to come through me to you so that you are encouraged and that you see the devil's assignment and his plot and his ploy is exposed to the light of Jesus Christ so that you will not be shipwrecked in your faith any longer. Can I have an amen? amen? Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, for every person within the sound of my voice, I pray that you would use the words that come out of my mouth. Any word that is not of God, Lord, may uh, it fall to the ground. But Lord, any words that are from you, I pray they stick like Velcro to the souls of every person in this room, to their hearts and to their minds. Lord, not to inform them, but to transform them. I, I thank you, Lord, that your words are spirit in life. They're spirit in life. I thank you that your words are living and active. I thank you, Lord God, that there are things that we, if we hide them in our heart, Lord, we won't sin against you. We won't walk away from you. And I just, I just pray in Jesus' name you deposit something in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Listen, um, thank you, brother. I, I, last week my son used three awesome words uh, to describe types of churches. You could say filters for church. And I'm just going to review these quickly with you. Uh, three, these three kind of filters were uh, a legalistic church, a liberal church, and then a life-giving church. I really want you to remember these terms, okay? A legalistic church, a liberal church, and a life-giving church. Now, he asked me, he said, Pops, can you unpack that a little more? Because I just, I just like cracked the window on that. So I want to review, and then I want to give you kind of a little illustration to describe those different ones. So first of all, are you guys with me? Yeah. So a legalistic church, this is a church that is... Uh, char by characteristics, very um, uh, restrictive, very um, rules-oriented, very regulations-oriented. Legalistic churches are rules and regulations, and what it ends up yielding, the fruit or outcome of that, is rebellion or rejection. Or rejection. They feel rejected. Why? Because the soil of a legalistic church is very um, works-based, or we, you could say performance-based. And so if you do good, you feel loved. If you do bad, you don't feel loved. You feel rejected. Are you with me, everybody? And when you, when you are living in that kind of a church on a continuum, uh, you eventually just can't, you can't live up to it. So what do you do? You rebel against God. You rebel against the church, and then you rebel against God. So this is, a, this is a problem in a legalistic church. Illustration. I know of a situation where uh, a PK, um, his father was the pastor. He was the son of the preacher. And, 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 and years ago, he got his girlfriend pregnant. And he got his girlfriend pregnant, and he realized that he was in deep sin, and he felt awful about it. And, and so he goes to his spiritual leader and to his father looking for advice and looking for counsel, but deeply ashamed in his heart. One of the most fearful things he could ever do. Calls the father, and the father says in so many words, there are many things that he said, but one of the things that he said was, son, at the end of the day, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go to the board of elders and we're going to convene. But what could happen as a result of this is because of your sin, the board of elders could remove me as being a pastor. Because the Bible says if you can't lead your family, you can't lead the church. And so this leader put upon and father put upon his son the weight of the ministry. I can't have this because of what you did. And then he went on to say... That after he came back from the eldership, the elders have decided to almost like uh, roll the dice. We'll see what happens. But what this couple is going to have to do, and pastor, you have to support it. He's, they're going to have to get in front of the whole church and confess their sin before all. And that's exactly what uh, this couple did. Under that pressure and under that public eye, uh, they, their sin uh, was exposed. And I guess a question you would ask yourself is, you know, is this so, in some way a type or, or of abuse? And I would suggest that it is. Is it a type of legalism? I would suggest that it is. On one hand, their sin wasn't in the dark, you could say. But on the other hand, everyone knew it and they were exposed before all. I believe we're supposed to be in cultures where... Uh, we cover people's sin. We don't conceal it. Listen to what I'm saying. We cover it. Cover means some people know who can help you with the sin to get over it and come through it. Conceal means nobody knows and it continues to grow and fester in darkness. Are you with me? There are certain things that everybody doesn't need to know. I have some struggles in my life, but I want you to know something. Somebody knows what those struggles are, but I ain't telling all you all my struggles. Can I have an amen? amen? 
And you don't want everybody to know all your struggles either. But to put all that out in front of people just produces shame or rejection or rebellion. And this couple went through some trauma as a result of that. The liberal churches are the exact opposite, the opposite of a legalistic church. A legalistic church would be all about restrictions and regulations, but a liberal church is all about acceptance and tolerance, listen, parentheses, to an extreme. Acceptance is good. Tolerance, if it wasn't redefined in today's culture, is good also. But to extremes, they can be bad. Anything to an extreme is bad. Drinking's not bad. Drinking to an extreme is bad, according to the Bible. So church, legalistic churches would say you can't drink. I would say, no, you can drink, uh, but you can't drink as much as you want because your, your freedom can't be at the expense of somebody else's struggle as a Christ follower. Are you with me, everybody? So churches say you can't drink, and the other churches say, go ahead and drink. There's freedom. You understand? Legalistic versus liberal. It can manifest in different behaviors, and both of those extremes produce sin. More sin, not less sin. I should get an amen out there. There's a lot of that. And so, so Jesus' first message, by the way, was not acceptance. It did have acceptance. We learned that from John chapter 8 when Pastor Devlin was speaking. But his first message was repentance. Amen. Repentance. You need a change in your heart. And, 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 and that's the job of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, not us. They, Jesus is the one that can change the hearts. The greatest miracle of all. Not raising the dead, not seeing blind eyes open, not seeing the sick healed. The change of a heart is still the greatest miracle on planet earth. Are you with me, everybody? But it requires repentance. But see, liberal churches abuse grace. They abuse it. And so they're, So I know a story of a pastor. He, 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 this is a while ago, and he pastored not too far from here, and he struggled with his sexual identity, and he struggled with certain addictions, one of those being alcohol, and both of those, both of those problems went haywire, just wild, and he's, he's preaching on Sunday mornings on grace, but on Saturday night, he was drunk in the bar, and his parishioners and people and leaders would see him there, and so instead of doing a 180 and repenting of that, he kept doing 360s. You know what I'm saying? Like he went right, right back to what he did before. And that's because he was over here in abuse of God's grace is sufficient for me. His power is made perfect. I know all those scriptures. But there, there needs to be true repentance at some point. Followers of Jesus start to look like Jesus. Be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And we progressively become changed from glory to glory. We're supposed to move forward. But usually you have these extremes, everybody. And these extremes create a lot of problems. And so we, we have, in liberal churches, we have 360 churches. But Jesus wants 180 churches where we change direction and we go in the direction of God. Now we have life-giving churches. Everybody say life-giving. I believe this is the heart of God, is a life-giving church. Not all churches are safe. Not all churches do you find significance. But that's God's desire, is that you feel safe. Meaning you can be struggling with something and you can be working it out. The Bible says we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That, that, that basically means that it's a process. Sanctification is the word. You get saved, your heart's changed, but your life is changed over time. Where does that happen? We, we say in the context of relationship. Where should that happen? In the church, in small groups, in teams, in relationships with other people in the church. But unfortunately, sometimes that's not allowed. There's not that permission to grow and to progress the way we need to. Yet the Bible tells us, everybody say the Bible. The Bible, the Bible tells us in, he, in Ephesians 3.10, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known. The full gospel, the full counsel of God is supposed to be made, through the, made known through the church. But sometimes people don't progress the way God intended to because how the, God, how the wisdom of God is made known and the timing of of God's wisdom sometimes is made known becomes a problem. Let me explain that. Sometimes people don't progress because of how truth is, is communicated and the timing of truth is given. So story, quick, quick, quick story. Uh, there's an individual in our church, I won't mention his name, but he's about 6'4", plays on the worship team, electric guitar, and his initials are JD. <laughs> and I have permission to tell this story. But, but his wife, he came from a Catholic background. Some of you come from a Catholic background. Welcome. If you're from a Catholic background, you're about 70% of this church is from that, that particular background. So we just have a different skin, and the methodology is different. But some of our beliefs are the same, and some of them are not. And we think this will be refreshing for you to continue to go here and grow in your faith. 
But they were coming, checking us out. And the wife scoped it out first. Why, women are usually the scouts of the church, and the men come later, right? I don't know what that is, guys, but pay attention. But anyway, so she checks out. Church likes it. She connects with some people. It was different. And so he comes. And this is back in the day when Connect Church had a different name at the time. My father was the pastor. The services, y'all, were three and a half hours long. Okay? Worship was like an hour and 20 minutes. The offering was like 30 minutes. The pastor preached for like another hour and 20. Two altar calls. I mean, it was. And then people, everybody had to get out of their seat and come down front. And let me tell you something. I'm just going to be honest with you. Some of it was awesome. Like, I loved it, right? But I was raised in the church. Like that's, I, I, I had years, I was, I, I, I was born under the seat in church. I went through like 29 revivals, slept through them, praise the Lord. Okay, that was my exposure. But a lot of people that came in, they, they hadn't seen anything like that. And so that, that, was, that was kind of the background. So he comes into a church like that. He's like, you can see, he was just looking around. I called it a turkey shoot. You know, people falling down, people getting covered blankets, people praying in weird ways, people saying stuff they don't understand, pastors talking over their head. We end up going to lunch after church because we had arranged to connect after church because his wife said, I want you to meet one of the pastors. I was the associate pastor at the time. We go to Bertucci's in Holliston, sit down at the table. He sits down. The second he sits down, he puts his hand on the table and goes, okay, PD, what was all of that? I knew exactly what he was talking about, right? And you know what I'm talking about, too. That's why you laugh. And here's what had to happen, and I'm going to give you a principle in a second. I had to download in two hours at lunch 20 years of my Christian experience. I was like, how do I, how do, I do this? And, and the Lord spoke to me something when we were transitioning our church. Our, we were holding on to our moorings, but it was getting a new wineskin. And the Holy Spirit kind of gave me this, 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 this picture, this analogy, and this principle. But it came, first of all, from Scripture. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Is light good, everybody? Yes. yes, but listen. Too much light, too fast, can be bad for somebody. What? What do you mean? Okay, so he showed me, God showed me by the Holy Spirit, and, and this is so helpful. And this tell you a little bit about a life-giving church. He showed me that the church is like a camera. Not like the camera you have right now. Some of you young people are not going to know what I'm talking about, okay? We used to have these things called cameras <laughs> where there was a big thing on the front of it, and you dial it backwards and forwards, and you had to put a roll of film in the back. All the old people help me out shout amen. <laughs> and what would happen is you, when, you, when you would put the film in, if you prematurely opened the back of that camera up and the film hadn't all rolled up, then the light would come on the film, and the film wouldn't develop. It would be over exposed. Is light good? Yes, but too much light too fast is bad. And God said, people that you're called to reach, Pastor Derek, are the film. I'm light. Listen, and the church is the camera. The church's responsibility is not to overexpose people. You're going to have to pay attention to the shutter speed. You're going to have to pay attention to the angles of light at which you communicate these things. Because if you give it to them too fast, if you give it to them in the wrong way, they will not develop. And so many people are, are spotlighted instead of shed light. They get spotlight instead of shed light. I looked up shed light on G chat GPT. Come on, somebody. And I'm like, what does that mean? Where did that phrase come from? And it means progressively reveal something. See, shed light and spotlight, spotlights, bam. And what we do is we overexpose people and they don't grow. We're supposed to shed, the church is to shed light. You ready for this? Are you ready for this? Here's what happened. And so I had to give to my friend JD 20 years and two hours because he had been under the spotlight. And if it wasn't for the relational connection and the Holy Spirit's intervention in that meeting, he would not have developed properly. God wants us to be life-giving in our relationships with people who are far from God. And what will end up happening is when it's a life-giving church, people will want more. They won't, they won't run from it. And this happens right here in this experience right now. Right now, light is being shed upon you and you are progressively becoming free. The truth that you know sets you free. Some of you that happened in worship, you've never been in a worship experience like this, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, people raise their hand. Wow. 
You might, then you go home, you read your Bible, it says, raise your hands, clap, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You're like, hey, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. But I didn't get raised like that. But yeah, but it's okay. That's what God wants for you. That's what we discover. And we discover that together as light is being shed abroad in your hearts. Are you with me, everybody? The benefit of that is what happens in that kind of a culture is people who are far from God decide on their own, uh, motivated by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not the manipulation of spiritual leaders, to change their lifestyle. So I've had many people who were like, they were doing things out of the will of God, having sex before marriage, living with their partner, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, after like three months, sometimes six months in the church, they'll come up to me, Pastor Derek. We've been listening to you preach the word, and I, I'm preaching the word every week. I'm not targeting anybody, and, but I'm doing it in a way that is life-giving. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying God has a better way for your relationship. Amen. That's a life-giving language. Are you with me, everybody? There's so much to this, I don't have time for all that. Turn to your neighbor and say, he ain't got time for all that. <laughs> so that's the heart of God. Let me give you the real problem. Here's the real problem. When Christians don't act like Christians, the real problem, first of all, big idea is, I want you to know, the church didn't let you down. A person did. Okay, so the real problem is not the church. The real problem is a person. Okay, and that's what happens. And, and Satan will use that person. His ploy is not to just cause a problem between you and that person. It's way bigger than that. His ploy is to separate you from God, the purposes of God, and the church, which is God's plan A. That's what his plan and that's what his plot is. It's diabolical, everybody. But the biggest problem, the most common uh, mis uh, you know, thing that people say they have a problem with the church is there's just a bunch of judgmental, there's just a bunch of narrow-minded hypocrites in the church. The problem people have is with hypocrites. Everybody say hypocrite. hypocrite. Turn to your neighbor and say, you hypocrite. <laughs> All right. What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone who professes to live one way, but the reality is they're, leading, they're living and leading a completely different life. There's a duplicity to their life, and, and they beha their behavior contradicts what they espouse, what they say that they believe in. And I'm just here to say the church is filled with hypocrites, lots of them. There's lots of them right on your row right now, okay, where people claim to do one, claim to do one thing and do another. And, here's, here's, and we're going to make fun of this a little bit just to have some fun. But it's confusing, right? It's kind of confusing when people say something and they, and they do something else. Like you've seen it. You've seen the girl on a Sunday morning and she's leading everybody in worship. Come on, let's go into the presence of God. Let's join in together. But Saturday night on Instagram, you saw her picture and she was clubbing it up. You know what I mean? She's da, 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 and she's got a drink. <laughs> And, and she's just throwing back, and, and she's dressed a little immodest, but in church, she's got her church clothes on. Come on, somebody. It's confusing, right? And then you, you, you got fathers that are telling their kids they need to serve God, and you need to dress a little bit more modest, girl. Look at how you, you can't go out of the house like that, only to find out later on that he was addicted to pornography. It's confusing. It's confusing. People, people get confused by that. Or a pastor is preaching the word and he's telling you how you should live and how your marriage should be. And then you find out years later he had an affair. And then he walks away from God and gives up on the church of Jesus Christ. This is happening all the time and, and people are confused. I, I was reading online just recently where a guy was going to gym. He was going to a gym to get in shape. He was trying to get back into shape and he's struggling with his weight. And then he sees this thing on, the, there's a banner on the wall that said, free pizza Fridays. <laughs> that's, that's, that's freaking confusing. <laughs> right? That's like somebody going to AA meeting and it's like, margarita Mondays. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> tequila Tuesdays. <laughs> Whiskey Sour Wednesdays, like, how does he know all those drinks? Never mind, never mind about that. Never mind about that, okay? I asked some people. I asked some people. I was told privately. <laughs> this is what people claim. They claim to do one thing, but they're doing something else. I could have gone all the way through the week. But anyway, um, <laughs> But pe this is what people think of the church. They think of the church, most people out there, and some people maybe in here who are just checking it out again, they think scandals, they think abuse, they think corruption, they think financial malfeasance, they think power struggles, judgment, hate. At the end of the day, though, the big one is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. And, and I, I read this quote by Brendan Manning. He's a really smart guy, wrote some incredible books. This is what he said. He said, the single greatest cause, listen to this, of atheism, there is no God. 
The single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, then walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. Wow. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Wow. If you listen to the talk show hosts when they're railing on us as Christ followers, it's always, it's always surrounded by hypocrisy, hypocrisy. And I just want you to know, Jesus gets upset about this too. If you're upset about it, I want you to know Jesus is upset about it. He talked about this a lot. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, look in your Bibles with me. It should show up on the screen. There's this thing called the seven woes of Jesus. And we're not going to do them all, but let me just say, here's what it says in, in, in Matthew 23. Jesus addresses the Pharisees in these seven woes. And by the way, 17 times in the New Testament, he addresses this hypocrisy problem. He was the one that actually introduced the word hypocrisy. It was, it was, it was, it came out of a, the actor's guild from the Greeks. The Greeks would, they would have these shows and they would wear a mask behaving as a character. And then when they changed characters, what did they do? They got a different mask, okay? Hippocrates. And so Jesus stole that word from that. He didn't steal it, so don't. Don't quote me on that, okay? Jesus used that word, okay, to create a word picture to describe how the Pharisees were behaving. And in Matthew 23, he says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, pastors of churches, you Pharisees, hypocrites, period. Jesus speaking. You are whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones um, and all sorts of impurity. In other words, you guys are putting on a big show, but you're filthy on the inside. Outside looks good, inside's really bad. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. So Jesus is basically saying, like, if you're giving for people to be seen to see it, it's hypocrisy. If you're praying for people to see it, it's hypocrisy. If you're fasting for people to, to show people what you're doing, it's hypocrisy. When you say one thing and you do another, Jesus says it's hypocrisy. Jesus had a zero, nil, nada tolerance for hypocrisy. But what people don't understand about that is Jesus was not, listen, he wasn't calling out their sin. He was calling out the show. It wasn't, he wasn't so upset with sin, he was upset with people pretending like they never do those things. In other words, like, okay, I like to golf. So if, if you're on the golf course, and, and what he's saying is if you cuss on the golf course for a slice, but then pretend you didn't do it, that's the problem, not that you cussed. Now, I'm not saying he likes it when you cuss, so don't misinterpret this, okay? He's more upset with the show than he is with the sin itself. Can I have an amen or an me from five people at least in here? Okay. All right. So he's, 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 he gets upset with that. He doesn't like that. In fact, this is what he says to people who fake it, and particularly to religious leaders. In Matthew 23, 33, he says, you snakes. Wow. You brood of vipers. Wow. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Jesus, would you tell us how you really feel about hypocrites? Because I, I wasn't clear. I wasn't clear on how you felt about it. He's basically like, hypocrites, you're going to go to hell. Okay, so now let's talk about that a little bit. Turn to your neighbor and say, talk about it. Okay, <laughs> this is what I had to ask myself when I was putting together this message, because I, I like to point things at me before I point it at you. By the way, there's so many people in here. Is it like 120 degrees in here? Okay, <laughs> praise the Lord. It's just me. All right. Uh, I had to ask myself, am I a hypocrite? And, and I had to get honest. I had to say, yes, I have moments of being a hypocrite. I can remember yelling at my kids to stop yelling. You, you know, why, Dad, why are the veins coming out of your neck and your head? I get this vein that comes right by John's probably doing it right now because I'm preaching. But anyway, we're, we're all, we all have these hypocritical moments. I was in Milford at uh, a stop and shop, and I'm coming out of the stop and shop. <laughs> this is just not too long ago. And it's crazy busy, and it's, I, don't, I shouldn't have been there at that time of day. It's, you know, it's like that 4.30, 5.30 range. But I'm starving Marvin. I don't care. i got to get food. You know what I mean? And so I go and I get my food, I kill, I hunt, I bring it into the car, and then I'm, on, I'm trying to go home, <clears throat> and I back out, and I can't get out, there's so many cars, so I just temporarily, so I can get a better angle, I back into a handicap spot, okay? Settle down, people. And so, <laughs> as I'm in the handicap spot, for literally like five seconds, this, bless her heart, older lady rolls down her window and starts yelling at me. You can't be in a handicap spot. You don't have a sticker. You don't have a sticker. You don't have a sticker. (laughs) 
being the good Christian that I am, I roll down my window. And in my head, I'm thinking, you don't know me, sister. You know what I mean? I'm from the back alley of Framingham. I will, whoa, whoa, settle down. I'm a pastor. And so I basically said, ma'am, I'm not parking here. I'm just stepping in for a second. And she keeps yelling, you don't have a sticker. You don't have a sticker. And, man, my blood pressure is going up, kind of like it is now because it's, re it's a revisitation of this. And, um, and this is what I'm thinking in my head. I'm about to park here, lady, <laughs> and get out of this car, and we're going to have a conversation. I don't care how old you are, how sweet you are to other people. And then it dawned on me, what if she goes to Connect Church? <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> I can't do that. And so I'm like, oh, peace, in love of Jesus, you know, and I, and I drive away, and I'm angry, and I'm like, Who could, how, how could she do that? So judgmental, rah, 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 rah. I had a, I wasn't a good pastor in that moment, okay? I had a hypocritical moment. Don't look at me like that. You do too. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, you do too. And the other person too. Definitely the other person does it too. Tell them that, Okay. Here's the, here's the problem. The big problem, listen, isn't hypocritical moments. It's a hypocritical lifestyle. It's a hypocritical life. That's what Jesus gets upset about. So I want to give you symptom solutions super fast. I have an impossible task. Hypocrites are actors, pretenders, posers. Hypocrites, what do they what do? They, do? They, want, they live for one thing, impressing people. They do everything. The Bible says in Matthew 6, it's all throughout it, to be seen. And you know what Jesus says? You're not going to be blessed for that because you've already got your reward. There's no rewards for hypocrites because they got their reward on their own. They got their rewards on their own. They're skin deep people. But a sign of a true Christian is it's more inward focused than outward. A sign of a true Christian is it's about being real, not fake. See, I don't know about you, but I, I try my best to just be real. What you see, what you get. I, I, this, is, this is what I want on my gravestone. Something like, he was the same person on the floor as he was on the platform. That's kind of what I want. And I don't, I, don't want, I don't want fake. Fake, by the way, can I just tell you something? I learned this because I did it for a while. Fake is exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. It's exhausting. So, so why, but why, Pastor, do people act like this? Let me give you three reasons why they act like this. Number one, sometimes Christians act like this. Listen, this is interesting. Because they're not Christians at all. They're not really Christians. They might carry their big King James Bible to church, sing all the songs, raise their hand, pray when you're supposed to pray, say amen, watch Joyce Meyer, <laughs> Joel Osteen every single week. But if you have not been transformed by the power and spirit of God from the inside out, if you have not fully repented of your sins and chosen to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm just telling you, you can go to church and not be a Christian. You, you, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Following Jesus makes you a Christian. Believing in God doesn't make you a Christian. Following Jesus makes you a Christian. Can I have an amen out there? And so many, why, do, why, do many, why do many get hurt? Because some claim to be Christians, and they're not, and they hurt us. Some, number two, are Christians, but they're really just immature. They're really just immature. Look at this, look at this text. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. Are you getting something out of this? Yeah. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13 says, For someone who lives on milk is still an infant. So sometimes these things happen. Why do Christians act this way? Because they're just a baby. There's a lot of babies in this room. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I love it. My favorite place in a hospital is a maternity ward. <laughs> babies mean, listen, to those of you who have been Christian a long time and you see immature Christians around you, that's a sign of healthy church. Babies are being born. New life. Next generation. You need to flip how you see things. It's awesome when that's the case. Are you with me, everybody? And so it says, some are, are still infants and do not know how to do what is right. Solid food, <clears throat> excuse me, is for those who are mature. You're like, Pastor, hey, uh, let's, 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 let's do a, a professional praise break, okay? Everybody just say, praise the Lord. All right. Yeah, you just got to do that once in a while. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> uh, but it's a solid food. It's for those who are mature. 
who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between what? Right and wrong. So some people are developing in their faith. Some people are what I like to call building their testimony. All right? Building their testimony. They're still in process. I have a, a new disciple, a, a, a brother that uh, had the opportunity to just kind of raise up in his faith. And he got, he got saved at Connect. He's growing his faith at Connect. And, and every single day we talk through technology. I have this thing called Voxer. He'll leave me these Vox drops. And, and we did, we're on a third book together. And what's so awesome is I remember when he didn't really, he, he loved God, feared God, but he didn't really know him. And I remember, like, <laughs> he comes from a certain trade where they're a little rough and a little, like, loose with the tongue, okay? And so every other word out of his mouth was, like, F-bombs and, you know, swears. And, and, and I'm just not affected by that because that's what I expect from people who are far from God. I'm not, like, offended by that. Now, we use Jesus' name in vain. I might get in there a little bit because I take that personal. But, but... Uh, but as he began to get the word of God hidden in his heart, what's so cool is he'd leave me a box like, I'm so hungry for God's word, and uh, you know, I just want to know more about the Bible. It's just effing awesome, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's the honest God truth. And then as he progressed, he'll say, oops, my bad, I shouldn't have said that. Forgive me. What, why? Why is that happening? Because he's moving from milk to solid food. He's progressing. <laughs> And moving to maturity. Are you with me? Yes, and I don't need to police that behavior because the Holy Spirit's doing a work on I just need to feed him the truths of God's word. If you plant good seed, it'll kill the weed. Woo! Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say amen. Come on, amen. All right, here's the third point, number three, last one. Some, some people, why, why do bad things happen? Why do, why do people act the way they do? Some are mature Christians, but they still can mess up. Church is messy, and sometimes strong, once strong, once healthy believers can still fall. And this, this is the hardest part for some people, because you're like, I, I didn't expect that, because I saw him or her like this, and then they did that. And, and I just want you to know, if you think you're impervious or invulnerable, or you're, you, you can't fall, let me just tell you, the Bible says, be careful. If you think you're standing firm, be careful lest you fall. Pride precedeth the fall. You're never, you're never impervious to temptation. You're never. It, it, you, anybody can fall, okay? Now, you can do things to, to prevent that and even predict its possibilities. And I, that's why we get together. That's why you got to build a, a, a healthy safety net around you of people where people really know you. And they know your strengths and they know your weaknesses. I should have had an amen or an oh me out of that, okay? <laughs> But some people mess up. Some people who love God, on fire for God, can tell a lie or could be, be, do, say things that are very carnal and fleshly. And sometimes they can do some things much worse than that. But sometimes the, and sometimes the most faithful, though, they can be deceived. We all mess up sometimes. But interesting, when people mess up, when you mess up, when I mess up, I blame my circumstances. But when you mess up, I blame your character. Wow, isn't, isn't it interesting? So we blame somebody else. We blame our circumstances, but we blame somebody else's character. Isn't that hypocrisy? Anyway, so I just want you to see that we can behave a certain way. And I just sometimes look at all this and go, God, how do you handle all this? I, sometimes I'm like, is he shocked by all this? Let me just tell you something. He ain't shocked by any of this. Nothing's taking God by surprise. He's not falling off his throne by all the mess in the church. In fact, look what it says in Psalm 103. It says, for he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are dust. The worship team can come. Let me just say something. He remembers that you're only dust. Tell your neighbor, you're dust. You're dust. And tell him you're dust too. Tell him I'm dust too. I heard, I heard Craig Rochelle read this verse in a message. And he read it from the New American Standard. And it says, you are but dust. Depending... <laughs> Depending on how you read that, you are but dust. Or you are but dust. <laughs> some of you are dust, and some of you are but dust. <laughs> some of you are but dust, okay? But but dust or dust, it basically means you, you, you can be weak. You can fail. You can make a mistake, and you can hurt people. And sometimes we have our expectations so high on people, and we need to lower that expectation a little bit because, you know what, they're just us. I just want you to know something. I'm dust. I'm, I'm your pastor, but I'm butt dust. Sometimes I'm butt dust. Some of you are going to get offended leave the church because I said butt dust. Let me just tell you something. 
The only thing that separates me from you on this platform, you know why I'm on this platform, by the way? Not because I'm, it's because so you can see me and hear me. I'm a man first, and I'm a man of God, okay? The thing that, the, the difference between me and you is not I'm better than you. The difference between me and you is I might have more, I might have more responsibility than you because of who I'm talking to. The Bible says he who teaches will be judged more strictly. So if I have a higher responsibility, you should inherently have a higher influence and concurrent authority, okay? But I'm not better than you. I'm not up here because I'm better than you. I'm up here just like you. And I still have to go before God's throne of grace, and I still have to repent of my sins just like you because I'm a child of God too. Are you with me, everybody? So I just want you to know I I'm not here because I think I'm here over you. No. In fact, if, if you could see me, and, and I have leadership that would attest to this, I'd be on the floor preaching. I don't like preaching up here. I'm only doing it. In fact, when the, the further they pull this back, the more I want to push it forward. I used to get in trouble for that. That just happened this morning. Praise the Lord. But I just want you to know, some of you might need to just, like, set the expectations right. You're dust. I'm dust. Some of us are but dust. We're born with a sinful nature. We're redeemed by Jesus. But we're all capable of sin. Can you stand your feet and let me pray for you? In Acts chapter 13, Barnabas and Paul are spreading the word of God at church. And while they're at church, in verse 49, it says, the word spread. But the Jewish leaders, these Pharisees, they incited God-fearing women. Who are the God-fearing women? The prayer ladies of the church of high standing. And it says the leading men of the church, everyone respected, so to speak. And they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they had them removed from the region. So when this happened to Paul, and when this happened to Barnabas, what did they do? Did they leave the church? Did they give up on the church? Did they turn from God? No. Could they have? Yes. Why didn't they? Because I think they believe something that I'm trying to get you to believe. The church didn't hurt them. A person did. A person did. God is perfect. The church is not. But they still knew. They, they chose not to be offended. They chose to believe something. They chose to realize something. That people are just dust. But dust. And the current logic today is if somebody hurts you, and if somebody uh, did something to you at church, then it must be the church's problem so people leave the church. And we don't do that in any other area of society. If we have a bad meal... We go back to that restaurant because we know there's still good food there. When we have, go to a, a follow a team in sports, sometimes they'll lose for decades, and we still support them as fans. But sometimes we can have one bad thing happen in church, and I'm not minimizing it. And we walk away from the church and sometimes even God. I want you to know something. There's still good food in the house of God. There are still wise people in the house of God. There are messes, but there are still miracles in the house of God. God still wants to use the church of Jesus Christ, and he wants you to be a part of it. Are you with me, everybody? In verse 51, it says, They shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them, and then they went on. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to minimize your hurt, sir, man, boy, or girl. And you might need prayer after church. You might need therapy beyond this. But I'm just telling you, I don't know anybody that is filled with joy and the Holy Spirit who is carrying unforgiveness, who is harboring hurt. They can't do it. And the solution is at some point, as dust, to kick off the dust. The dust of somebody else's sin. The dust of something that might have happened to you. The dust of maybe what something you did. You've got to shake the dust off your feet. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, for every person within the sound of my voice, I pray that you would help them. Supernaturally. I don't know how you do it. I don't know. Uh, I just don't know how you can do it, Lord. But surgically by your spirit, would you help them see that... God is perfect, the church is not. Would you help them see the church didn't hurt them, a person did. Would you help them see that I'm dust, and they're dust too. And I might need to adjust my expectations, but would you help them, in addition, Lord, help them shake off the hurt, shake off the dust. Lord, I want people to be able to thrive and to be filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And I ask that you just pour out your joy over this church. Lord, I want this church to be a life-giving church. It's filled with joy and happiness and laughter. And Lord, we're seeing incredible things happen. Hearts opened up. People be set free and delivered. People be healed in their minds and in their hearts, not just in their bodies. In the name of Jesus, I pray for the joy of the Lord become their strength. That the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. I just, I just sense the Spirit of God in this room. 
Maybe you're here today, every head bowed, every eye closed, honor the person around you. Maybe you're here today and, and something about this word is penetrating your heart, but you know it, you might have been a part of a church, but you never, you never let Jesus be a part of your life. Listen, I'll tell you this. I'd rather, I'd rather you never come to this church again if I didn't introduce you to Jesus, though. I want you to join Jesus more than I want you to join my church. Don't get me wrong. We want you here. But I want you to join Jesus. If you've never fully surrendered your life, you, you, you're, just not, you're not just not carrying a Bible. You're just not going to that cool church connect over there at such and such a place. No, you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, and you're choosing to follow him this day. If that's you and you want to do that, just Say, Pastor, pray for me. Raise your hand. Raise your hand good and high. Don't be afraid. Good and high so I can see you all over the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look, look me in the eye, too, so I can see you. That's good. That's good. That's good. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Thank you for your courage. All the way in the back. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's awesome. You can put your hands down. Church, would you join these people that raise their hand? Would you say this from your heart, those that raise your hand? I want you to really mean it. I want you to say this from your heart. Say, Jesus, today is the day of salvation for me. Today I invite you into my life. I don't want to just make a decision. I want to be a disciple. I receive by grace through faith what Jesus did for me. Help me to live the life, not of a hypocrite, but of a true follower of Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, let's worship him. Let's exalt his name. Come on, let's give him our best in Jesus' name.